Michael, I am so excited to have you on Outlier Academy to talk about HVMN and the latest product that you've uh, created called Ketone IQ. Welcome to the podcast. Daniel, thanks so much for having me and thanks everyone for listening in. It's going to be a fun one. <laughs> yes, there's a ton There's a ton to explore. And so we're going to explore, obviously, the nutritional aspect, uh, get into a little bit of the science of how ketones work, and then we're also going to talk about um, the, the business of HBVMN and how you've iterated on that product. To, to start, and we're going to cover a ton of ground, <laughs> so um, I'm going to try to squeeze in as much as I can into this interview, but to start, can you just share a quick bit about your background? I know you're a marathon runner. I don't know if that was part of the impetus to focus on ketones and, and building HVMN, but kind of share if you can a little bit of your origin story and the origin story of the company. Sure. I am a marathon runner. I, my PR for the marathon is 242, so about six minute miles for the marathon. Wow. So I run in Boston and not winning the Olympics or anything like that, but I'm finishing top percent, top 1% in any given marathon. And it, it's a serious hobby and it definitely dovetails with my interest in human performance and everything that we're building at HVMN and everything, all the community and business and everything we're building here. It definitely, definitely connects. Like, as I'm sure a lot of other entrepreneurs can recognize that there's, it's nice when your, your personal and your professional dovetail together. My background, I'm from Chicago, went to public school in, in Chicago, was an international baccalaureate student got had the good fortune to get into Stanford. That's what brought me out to the West Coast, studied computer science and product design there and got really into after graduating, got really into biohacking and essentially applying engineers systems thinking to human body. Your human body is the most advanced piece of technology you'll ever own. And it, we're at this really interesting period right now where we're learning a lot about the body. There's a proliferation of consumer devices, sensors that let us understand and observe what's going on in our body. We are pushing a lot of innovation in on the nutrition component of what can you do to, to drive meaningful output changes in your body as a system. So I started getting really into, uh, interested in biohacking, performance optimization. My co-founder and I started a business called Nutrobox. We were one of the first to take the concept of nootropics. This was in 2014. We took the concept of nootropics and really made it mainstream. We got covered by everyone, Vice, Wall Street Journal. We were on Shark Tank. We were one of the first ones to say, hey, look, like caffeine is cool. Everyone, everyone, a, a billion cups of coffee are being drank every day. What if you stack things on top of caffeine? If, there are things you can combine with caffeine to improve the performance profile. And so we, we followed that along a really interesting path and then began broadening out our interests into, I, be, I got really into marathoning can talk more about that. We got really into intermittent fasting. My co-founder and I did a seven-day fast. We're doing regular weekly fasts and had a, a big fasting community in San Francisco. Got a lot of coverage around that and talking about metabolic health. And hey, it turns out that the human body is not supposed to be eating three meals a day plus snacks of Slurpees and Snickers bars and all that. that that's not, what? <laughs> that's not true to our human evolutionary context and how we're, how we're supposed to operate. And then we had this insight around ketones where in 2016, 17, this is when Bulletproof Coffee was taking off. And, you know, anyone who's ever, anyone or in and around biohacking has at least tried Bulletproof, tried taking black coffee, put butter and MCTs in there. And the whole point of that being instead of fueling with sugar, you fuel with fat, which your body turns that fat into ketones. Bulletproof coffee was trending. A lot of people were trying the ketogenic diet. We were leading this movement around intermittent fasting. And all of these activities, including also endurance sports, all these activities, they are, they are intentionally reducing your body's carbohydrate store and intentionally inducing your body to create ketones and to fuel off of ketones. My co-founder and I, we asked the first principles question on it, which was, hey, we're going through all these hoops to have our bodies make ketones. We asked that kind of dumb, smart question, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs can identify with of, hey, if ketones are so cool, why can't you just go to the store and buy a ketone? And pulling on that thread led to years of deep work. We started uncovering early work that DARPA and the US DOD 
had done. We we took that work and translated that and and manufactured it at scale. We re-engaged with the U.S. DoD and secured a six million dollar contract with Special Operations Command around a ketone drink around our version one of our ketone drink. We worked with elite operators all over the board, and then we've just been cracking at it for years. And earlier this year, we launched a major update, version two of our ketone drink called Ketone IQ, where we brought down the price considerably. The Navy SEAL version was a little bit more expensive and kind of crazy tasting. And we brought it down to a spot where it's $4 a serving. So so I want to get it down to 40 cents a serving. So there's still orders of magnitude to work at. But we are at a spot where it's about the cost of a latte or a CBD drink or other functional beverages, a kombucha, other beverages that people are, are used to. So we're in the ballpark where high performers can have access to this really cool fuel that has previously only been available to high performers, or you can only have it in your system if you do keto diet and fasting and, and induce your body to make this magical ketone molecule. So we're now at a spot where it's accessible and we're in stores and gyms and cafes. And it's been a fun journey translating from DARPA lab to consumer movement. It's not an overnight thing, but it's been a a really fun journey. And I think it's flexed a lot of different muscles for myself as a founder, my co-founder, and our team across the board. It's been a it's been a, a fun journey. Yeah. And well, and as we're going to explore, um, you know, there's a lot more left to go. And there's a lot that's already happened. Like I remember first, I think it was maybe two years ago when I first discovered HVMN. And I remember that first v- version one, we'll talk about it a little bit later in the episode. But I love, you know, we were talking about before we started recording, you you described that as a science fair version of, uh, of what you're building. Um, and we'll get into what that is and and um, is it a ton to explore. The one question I wanted to ask just before we go on, I was asking this before we hit record, but obviously the name of the company is HVMN, which, you know, you kind of look at and immediately think you, you fill in the missing letters. You're like, it, it means human, but it also has a second meaning. Can you talk about what each of those letters stands for? Yeah, HVMN stands for Health Via Modern Nutrition. And a lot of people are maybe familiar with the the quote, let thy food be thy medicine, where before you go and take a battery of pharmaceuticals, you're like you're already eating something every day. And what you're eating is directing the course of your life. You are improving or or worsening your biomarkers for health. Your food is putting you into a certain state. It's spiking your blood glucose and inching you closer to diabetes or it's not. It's making you feel better or it's making you feel worse. It's it's the the step by step brick by brick. Oftentimes when we think of medicine it's this like major thing you're introducing a antibiotic or you're introducing a statin or you're introducing some major major abrupt change into into your life but in reality day by day brick by brick step by step what you're eating is that's the stuff of life like that's what's leading you towards a larger or smaller number of total healthy years on the planet. And so being mindful about that is what was the driving factor behind the company and health via modern nutrition. How can we be have ha, how can we have better health? How can we perform better uh, through the food that we eat every day? Yeah. Yeah, I love that background. So I want to first start by talking about ketones. And then we'll talk about ketones as a substrate, which is this interesting idea you introduced to me when we were talking about how we might cover in this interview. And then we'll go into kind of version two, version two of the product. But I want to start with with ketones, because at least, you know, from my perspective, I feel like ketosis is something I've heard a lot about. Obviously, ketones are a key part of ketosis. But I don't know how familiar people are with either ketosis or ketones. So I want to start out with some basics. Can you start by just sharing your explanation or your best attempt at an explanation of ket- what ketones are and talk a little bit about how they're naturally produced in the body? Yeah. Ketones are the oldest form of fuel. Our body has always made ketones for 300,000 years, as long as there's been humans or even pre-human homo, homo erectus, like pre-humans were even making ketones. What a ketone is, is it's a metabolic substrate, your body makes it when you have low levels of circulating glucose, carbohydrates in general, and it is a super efficient metabolic substrate. We evolved the ability to make ketones because 
Glucose crosses the blood-brain barrier. Fat does not. So if you haven't eaten something with glucose in the last couple of days, or if you've been moving around a lot and burning off that, that glucose store, your body's running low on glucose. You can only store a couple of days worth of glucose. Your body can store a month worth of body fat, even if you're a lean individual. Just to give some numbers around it, you can store around 2,000 calories of glucose, and you can store around 200,000 calories of fat. So we're talking two orders of magnitude. One analogy is it's like RAM versus your hard drive. You can store a, a little bit amount of, glu of glucose and you can store a lot of fat. The issue with fat is that it, fat it cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. Humans have a very large brain. So what happens when we are on the savanna X 10 hundreds of thousands of years ago and we're running low on blood glucose, we haven't eaten something with carbohydrates or we've been moving around a lot. And we have these large brains. Humans famously have largest brain for our body size of any animal. That's part of what makes us special. And what do we use to fuel this brain? Our, our body creates ketones. And ketones are this super efficient substrate. So they have, by sub, substrate has a specific meaning where they contain calories. They're a metabolic substrate. They enter your mitochondria and they produce ATP, the cellular currency of our, of our cells. Uh, the energy currency of our cells. And ketones exist to power our brain, they power our muscles as well. And our body naturally produces them when we're low on glucose. And so, you know, fast forward to modern times, in the early 20th century, researchers started looking at this idea of a ketogenic diet, where how do you make your body make a ketone? Well, if you deliberately reduce your intake of carbs, your body will start making ketones. The first application of a ketogenic diet or ketosis is in the early 20th century, there were, there was a study done around children who were having seizures. And the hypothesis was that these children have some malfunction in their brain's ability to metabolize glucose. So let's put them on a ketogenic diet and see if by powering by with ketones instead of glucose, are we able to reduce the instance of seizures. And it turns out the answer is yes, that, hmm. that they were able to significantly re reduce the, the amount of seizures that these kids were having by applying a ketogenic diet. So ketones are, have these really interesting properties. They're, they're super efficient. They are an alternative to glucose, whether you have that, whether you're inclined towards seizures or not, like ketones can power the brain, they can add functional capabilities. And We've been seeing a lot of science pan out over the last hundred years. Where, you know, fast forwarding to the twenty first century, we've we've been looking at ways to act, actively create a ketone. A lot we discovered a lot around what can happen when you when you induce your body to make its own ketones, and that just led to the question of okay, what if you go and drink a ketone? And that's where that's where our our part of the story picked up is uh, yeah, what happens if you if you have a direct ketone drink? Yeah. Thank you for that overview. I mean, I think it's just enormously helpful. I, I want to kind of go one level deeper and talk about and just compare and contrast a little bit of ketones versus glucose. Because as I was thinking about this, you know, you you shared this example, which is obviously really resonant of ketones being the oldest form of fuel. And you can think back, obviously, 50, 100, you know, thousands of years. And our diet was very, very, very different. And today, obviously, you know, we have an obesity epidemic generally. Uh, we have a di diabetes epidemic generally. And so just even in the food that we're eating, you know, I'm always surprised. Uh, I look at nutrition labels all the time. I'm always surprised. It just it feels like literally every product has sugar added to it <laughs> or glucose. Yeah how to do it in some shape or form. And so one of the questions I want to ask is, you know, it seems like over time, our diet has become much, much more glucose rich, where glucose is in almost everything. So help people understand the difference, both in the quality of energy, and some of the other pros and cons of a ketone versus a glucose. Like I know, for instance, um, ketones provide energy with less oxidative stress. I'm sure there are other things. How do you think about the pros and cons there? Yeah, sugar is really interesting, because in the ancestral context, there wasn't an abundance of straight sugar. It was really hard to, there, there's not table sugar. Table sugar actually came up in the last few hundred years where it actually drove a lot of the, the slave trade as well, where there, hmm. there was this discovery around 
sugar plantations and hey, we can extract sugar from sugar cane and we can make this really refined pure table sugar. But for you know hundreds of thousands of years before that, you didn't have straight sugar. There's not that many sources in nature of there's no sources in nature of of just straight sugar. The closest would be honey, but honey is really hard to come by. It exists in certain regions only. And, you know, you got to climb up a tall tree and battle off a bunch of bees. And it's it's really hard to access. We've bred a lot of our fruits to be like very high in sugar. If you look at ancient bananas, ancient apples, they were they look very different. We've intentionally bred them to be much more palatable. But palatable means a lot of times higher in sugar. So we've done a lot to make things like sugars Sugar is very tasty. It's very addicting. It's very palatable. And we've we've done a lot to make our food supply taste yummier. But it's not necessarily a good thing. It's it's backfired in a lot of ways where we now have there's a study that showed 88% of American adults have are are metabolically unhealthy. We have skyrocketing rates of obesity. A lot of people are are pre-diabetic, diabetic. I think diabetes is not this black and white switch where one day you just have diabetes it's like similar to noise induced hearing loss where if every day you're listening to loud music slowly over time you're going to decay your ability to hear things same thing with your metabolism if you're constantly barraging it with high levels of sugar your body can only respond to it so much like when what happens when you eat sugar is your blood glucose rises and then you release insulin to address that blood sugar. And then over time, if you do that habitually and you're constantly spiking, the insulin stops working. You develop insulin resistance. And that's diabetes. And again, it's not this like black and white thing where like you're completely normal and then one day you have diabetes. It's a, it's a decay function over time. So it's something a lot of people should be thinking about. I think a lot of people are thinking about, not just because of what we're doing, but if people are familiar with continuous glucose monitors, companies yep. like levels. levels are are doing great work here where you're able to see how your diet and, uh, and life's, other lifestyle factors are affecting your glucose levels with the mission being, hey, like spend less, have less area under the curve of elevated glucose, avoid really steep spikes, and it'll be better for your metabolic health in general. You'll feel better day by day, and you'll avoid some of the largest issues that people that are you know causing mortality in the in the country Mm -hmm. it's all through your diet yeah i love that you you know i love that description of it being a decay function because i think it's a really clean interesting way to think about it and we'll link to it in the show notes we had the team at levels on previously and we did a deep dive on on levels and one of the things that was most interesting there too is um that you know what they what they find what what uh, any customers that use levels find is yes it is about what you eat but there's also a really tight interesting coupling between what you eat and what you're doing from a physical activity perspective and you can actually eat things that aren't great for you but if you couple it with the right physical activity like if you you know occasionally eat a pizza or have a big bowl of uh, of pasta but you then couple that with an immediate walk or or you know exercise right. for 30 minutes what they find is you almost have no spike in in glucose and so anyways i think the only reason i'm sharing that is I think for me, it's always fascinating to learn too that it's also just very, very complicated. There's all these; it's a complex system, and there's all these factors that are that are influencing it. I one of the things that I, I found doing research for this was, um, you know, looking up people's testimonials and just their general experiences of using drinkable co- uh, ketones and using HVMN. And one of the things that was fascinating is, and this goes to the quality of energy I want to talk about for a second, is the way people describe how they feel when their body's being powered by ketones was really interesting. You know, they talk about one, feeling hyper-focused, two, feeling like they're in a flow state, both physically and mentally. And so to me, it almost seems like, you know, there is literally a quality of energy difference do you feel that? And do you find that customers commonly feel that when they switch to and start using drinkable ketones? Basic mechanisms of action around ketones, they're very different from glucose, where you can think of them as cousins. They kind of operate opposite to one another, where high glucose is low ketones, hmm. low glucose is high ketones. So one way to think about it is you want to spend your life with less elevated glucose. An equivalent statement is you want to spend your life with higher 
elevated ketones. And you want to use more ketones as a fuel. And the mechanism of action on it is that when ketones turn into cellular, cellular energy, so ATP, if people remember their high school biology, the mitochondria is the power plant of the cell. You have substrates that come into the mitochondria and that gets, there's, a, there's something called the Krebs cycle where the substrates interchange with other different factors and they create ATP and ATP is the energy currency of your cell. When ketones turn into ATP, they do it more efficiently than glucose. So they use about 30% less oxygen to do so. And in that conversion process, they create less oxidative stress. You can think about your metabolism in general is this engine where if you're putting fuel into an engine and that engine is running for years and years, there's going to be some gunk build up like an engine cannot run just indefinitely for a thousand years. The engine is going to have some build up, but you can use cleaner fuels that cause less damage to the functioning of that engine over time. So straight table sugar, like straight pure sugar is going to cause a lot of oxidative stress, you can measure free radicals, reactive oxygen species, like you can you can measure that, hey, there is a increase in this bad byproduct of it's like, it run, it's like running off of coal, as opposed to <laughs> natural gas, like you there's, sure. you can see certain types of fuel have a dirtier outcome than other types of fuel. So ketones are really efficient on those on on those aspects where they use less oxygen to begin with, and then they create less oxidative stress as you are metabolizing them. And it has all sorts of downstream effects where subjectively, you, you feel the lights are more switched on when you have ketones circulating, and they're crossing the blood brain barrier, and your neurons are using those. For a lot of people, it feels a certain type of way or when people stack it with other compounds like caffeine, or functional mushrooms or other plant based things that people are into that that those are all creating a increase in brain activity. And that increase in brain activity is creating an increase in brain energy demand. Where's that energy coming from? Well, again, it's like, are you using coal or are you using solar power? Like what, what is providing that brain energy? So subjectively, people, a lot of people feel switched on when they're drinking ketones, when they have elevated ketone levels, when they're drinking ketones as well. You know, a lot of people, the insight was, again, rolling back to what the insight was, a lot of people feel really sharp when they're eating low carb. They feel really sharp when they're doing a intermittent fast. They feel really sharp when they're on a run and they feel runners high. In all these contexts, they're inducing their body to elevate ketone levels. So a drinkable ketone isn't meant to like replace those. It's meant more as another tool in the toolkit of, hey, if you like the way it feels when you have elevated ketones, this is another way to get there that you can use and compound with the other lifestyle and diet things that you're doing. Sure. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I want to talk for a second about ketones as a substrate because, um, you know, one of the analogies you used when we were first talking about the ketones is um, that ketones are similar to hydration. You know, you talked about that water is another substrate, helps helps everything. You know, one, during the day, if you're hydrated, you think clear, more clearly. You have higher levels of energy. At night, with water, you actually sleep better. And so it's this fascinating thing that it's not like it's only beneficial at one time during the day or in one state. It's been, it's, it benefits kind of everything. Um, and it sounds like ketones is very similar to that. Talk a little bit about other substrates. I know maybe caffeine is one, maybe CBD is one, and what a substrate is, and then how that relates to ketones as a substrate. To draw the line there, caffeine is not a substrate. Caffeine is a okay. is a drug that's really specific, where it is caffeine is an adenosine blocker. Where adenosine is your sleep hormone, so if you have caffeine you're blocking your sleep hormones, you're going to feel less sleepy, you're going to feel more alert, it does this really specific thing. Drugs in general tend to be very targeted, like they do, they activate a really specific pathway, and they they hit it with a sledgehammer. And that's either good, or it's bad, or you know, usually, usually you're doing it for an intended effect. And, and it does that intended effect really well. Substrates, on the other hand, are, they go anywhere where there is the demand. So they are not inherently targeting a single pathway with a sledgehammer, they're just widely available. So hydration is an interesting analogy if we're thinking about what a substrate is, where if it's 11am, 
and you're dehydrated and you drink some water, you're going to have a better energy level. You're going to be better at focusing on what's in front of you, whether that's work or exercise or whatever. If it's 11 p.m. and you're thirsty, you're not going to be able to fall asleep. You're going to be tossing and turning. If you have some water, water is necessary for pretty much every bodily function. And you're going to have an easier time going to sleep if you're well hydrated. So, okay, how does this magical water (laughs) seem to help you with energy during the day and then it helps you sleep at night? It's because water is not a drug. And water is also not a substrate. Like there's no calories in water. You wouldn't consider it to be a metabolic substrate. So this is is an analogy, but that Mm -hmm. hydration is so fundamental to everything that you're doing. The way to think about it is your circadian rhythm. So throughout the day, you have an energy rise. So if 11am, your energy is rising or peaking, your body is going to be pulling what it needs in order to do that function as dictated by your circadian rhythm. At 11pm, you're going to be dipping or at the at the bottom of your energy levels, you're going to be activating your your rest and recovery parasympathetic nervous system. And your energy is going to be pulling what it needs in order to do that. So that's where this, the like caffeine is going to be really helpful at 11 a.m. It's going to be very antagonistic <laughs> at 11 p.m. But something like water or something like ketones, where it is broadly helping your body do what it is trying to do at that given moment, it's, it's more broad and dynamic than a drug. So when we say substrate, it's that it goes to wherever your body needs, like whatever function your body is trying to accomplish at the time, your body is requiring some fuel, there's some energy expenditure, sleep requires energy, exercise requires energy, all the things that we're doing require energy. And so having a more efficient fuel to provide those energy needs. That's what we're talking about here when we talk about Mm -hmm. ketones. Yep. Yeah. So so just to maybe, you know, flesh that out or put a point on that, it seems like uh, ketones. So the, the analogy is similar to water, but only in the sense that your body always needs energy. And if it needs energy, then ketones versus something like glucose, as we talked about earlier, is a much, much, much cleaner form of energy. And it doesn't, at least from my understanding and from what we've talked about, it seems like it has, whereas with glucose, there are a lot of cons like oxidative stress and spiking your glucose and causing insulin. Uh, none of that really happens with ketones. And so it's a substrate in the sense that it's energy that goes anywhere when your body needs it. It can cross the blood-brain barrier, and it's also very clean. Am I kind of getting that right? <laughs> Anything to add or change about that? Yeah, that's right. And I, and that's why there's so much interest around it. So what really clicked for us was in 2016, 17, when we were looking at fasting, ketogenic diet, hey, can you drink a ketone? When we started looking through the literature, we saw that in the early 2000s, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, a lot of people know that because DARPA created the internet and they generally investigate frontier technologies that like decades later see the light of day. So DARPA in the early 2000s had this program called Operation Metabolic Dominance. Pretty badass. Hmm. And it's amazing. (laughs) And in that they were looking at ketones because of a lot of what we've been discussing here, where they had these hypotheses that, hey, ketones are a substrate, they can help with all sorts of things. What happens if we give them to soldiers in these different contexts? What about in hypoxia, low oxygen? What about when they're sleep deprived? What about here, there? We know that they're really interesting, they're dynamic as a substrate, what happens if we supply them in these different contexts? So DARPA did the foundational work in early 2000s with the National Institute of Health. And they created it was extremely expensive it was $20,000 a drink and wow. tasted absolutely insane just battery acid crazy. But they did some of the basic science around it where they showed some of these key findings around like the efficiency of ketones, they proved out that hey, you could you can make a ketone, you can you can pass it through your GI system, it's safe. So they did some of the core basic stuff. And then as DARPA tends to do, like, like they established that it was feasible, but then kind of left it up to the left it up to the reader to complete the exercise. Like they basically left it on a shelf until we in 2016, 17 started looking at it. And we said, Hey, okay, ketones are clearly having a moment like we're a lot of people are, are doing all these fasting, ketogenic diet, bulletproof, all that, all those things that we've been talking about. Why don't why don't we figure out how to actually scale this out? So we were the first to make it at scale, bring it out to the market. You you tried it out, the HVMN ketone 
version one. It was still pretty expensive. We, it was thirty dollars a dose. Um, it tasted still tastes pretty crazy, but it was like you could you could drink it. And for us, that then locked that then unlocked a six million dollar contract with U.S. Special Operations Command. Where once we were able to make it at scale, we were able to re-engage with the DoD and say, hey, okay, like let's let's try this in a broader context where we're getting hundreds of people in these different contexts that we're really interested in studying. So we got that going and we started making it broadly available to, I mean, at that price point, it was, we say it was broadly available. Like you could buy it on our website, but <laughs> realistically, you know, $30 a drink, the, the people who were having it were all high, like extremely high yeah. performance tour, yeah. tour de France athletes was a big market for us. Like super baller execs were drinking it here and there. Uh, it was still very like upper echelon product this is all pulled along like our first big customer on it was the dod and then as that progressed that's where we had the light bulb moment of okay like the way that peter Thiel frames things up like the what's the big secret that you know that no one else knows like it's like okay either we are insane and we are on this out on this limb and we're we're just like drinking our own kool-aid drinking our own ketones literally <laughs> or this is this is big, like the way that collagen has proliferated or the way that CBD yep. has proliferated or the way caffeine has proliferated, like ketones, Adaptogens. either we're insane or ketones are the next caffeine or CBD. I don't know. Schrodinger's box. Like we, the only way to know <laughs> is to observe the only, like, and, yes. and my co-founder and I and our team, we had enough conviction around it based on what we were seeing from our work with SOCOM, based on what we were seeing with elite performers that, Hey, like, there's something here. If we can, if we continue marching down the cost curve on this and make this broadly available, make it more palatable, make it more accessible, do the hard work of just educating and 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 helping people understand this and how this relates, making metabolic health, which is kind of like scary or complex or not not like the your typical cocktail conversation around metabolic health. It would, if we can broach that and get people thinking about it, you know, people were not always thinking about personal computers. Yep. Now everyone has a computer in their pocket. So if we can cross that chasm, if we can take the big secret that we know that no one else knows and make it mainstream, that seemed really interesting. It seemed very hard and challenging. And you know, as an entrepreneur, it's it's been interesting seeing other other companies like succeed and fail and move move. And as we've been focused on what what we've been doing, it's it's been fun. It's been a, it's been a challenge. And but I we're, we've turned this corner in the last I would say like six months where Basically, everything that we've been building towards for the last four or five years is coming true. Where it's it's like we are in we are crossing the chasm. I I would say we're still in the early innings, but like we're maybe in inning two, no longer in inning one. Like we we've crossed some threshold where it seems like it's actually taking off in the mainstream way. Yeah. No, you've moved on to the next level of the game. And I mean, even just, and you've said this, and I want to underscore this because it's big, but anytime you see a company able to reduce costs by an order of magnitude, that is huge. I mean, you know, we're talking about a literal 10x reduction in in, in costs or going to a tenth of the cost of what you had previously, which obviously opens it up. And, and to your point that you alluded to earlier, if it's $4 today and you can get it down to $40 in the future. Or and four then, cents. You know, or 40 cents. 40 cents. Sorry, 40 cents. Yes. Um, and then, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, you, we've talked about adaptogens as a, you know, a comparison collagen, CBD, you know, you see these things now like CBD, I think is, a, is an interesting example where that now is in, you can buy snacks with it. You can buy desserts with it. You can buy sparkling water with it. And so it truly is kind of this, this, uh, one, it's, it's seen somewhat mass adoption, but two, now it's made its way into all these different kind of intake mechanisms, which is, which is really fascinating. Um, I want to talk for a second about the performance performance benefits of ketones. And I want to kind of double click a little bit on the special operations piece that you talked about there. Um, because it's, you know, as you described to me, it, it, well, just to kind of walk that back a little bit. So the Department of Defense basically paid you, you won a $6 million contract to be able to sell this V1 version of the product to the Department of Defense. And that was clearly, it sounds like that was testing and maybe some infield use, but talk a little bit about exactly what those, what, the, what, what conditions they were operating under, under whether that was a test or in real life, because it's somewhat staggering. And I think it makes it really clear why they were willing to have a $6 million contract specifically for using ketones as energy. Yeah, we went through the process via SBIR, STTR. Those acronyms might mean something to folks who have been looking at government contracting in some ways. 
the government is the enterprise of all enterprises as far as developing your business in there. There's a lot of work to to do to get it done, but in doing that, you the U.S. government's a very big customer, and they have a lot of intent behind what they do. And when they're into something, they're into something in a big way. The specific work that we've been looking at. So you're right that this they they bought. It was not the case they just bought six million dollars of ketones and we shipped it over on a pallet. It was six million dollar contract to advance the research and understanding around it. So some component of that six million dollars was for ketones per se, but there was also a significant amount of that was around, hey, like, can you take those ketones and do XYZ research? So there's seven different subtasks that we have around ketones where they're being used for different in-field applications, some in the lab, some out in the field. One of the most interesting findings, the, the Special Operations Command was really interested in pushing people to their limits and then seeing how ketones can negate some of the detriment it's a, like a double negative where, like, okay, if you're at <laughs> hypoxia, if you're at 20,000 feet of altitude, you have a reduction in blood oxygen. So at sea level, you're at 100% oxygen saturation. At 20,000 feet of altitude, you're at like 65% blood oxygen. When you have elevated ketone levels via a drink, you are able to increase your blood saturation by 10%. So bat, you're able to bring it up into the mid 70s at that altitude level. And then on the actual performance component, what we're doing at altitude is we're so we're simulating a 20,000 feet of altitude level of oxygen. And then and then participants, they're all military members that that are they're rucking. So they're they're wearing like heavy weight and they're marching at incline for a period of time, 30, 45 minutes. And then they're doing target practice. So a, a battery of cognitive tests. And as expected, right, if you're at altitude, and you're doing something really physically challenging, you're going to expect to see some decrement at t equals zero, like before you do the, the rucking at altitude, you're going to be, you know, at 100% performance. After the physically demanding work, you're going to have some decrement, you're gonna be a little bit more tired, a little bit less, less sharp. And ketones, again, in, in that context, where they're also increasing blood oxygenation, they're also increasing cognitive sharpness. So you see less of a, a significantly less of a decay in cognitive performance. People are shooting more accurately. People are able to have better short-term memory, short-term reaction time. So it's really cool. It's like when when pushed to your limits, are you able, how, how can you recover cognitive performance? And that's where we're seeing ketones step in. And there's a couple different you know, follow on hypotheses for it. Is it due to the fact that ketones require less oxygen to turn into ATP? Is it due to some signaling effect of ketones that just by having ketones present, like yet ketones do provide a form of calories, but they also provide a, a signal to the rest of your body that can turn on different systems. So there's there's like follow on hypotheses from that. So we are in phase two of our work with SOCOM and we're going for phase three, which is the final phase. And it's it's basically further exploration of hypotheses, bigger budget, larger deployment, and seeing how things pan out there. So to ask the kind of obvious or dumb question, I'm guessing what this is leading to is at some point in time, there could be a world where special forces soldiers are literally given ketones as just part of supplements before they go and do very challenging tasks. Am I kind of understanding that right? <laughs> yes. I think it would be interesting to talk about. Um, so, with your with your background as a marathon runner, um, you know, it's effectively a. What I, I guess it would fall into the realm of a long distance sport. I know people that also do, uh, you know, runs that aren't marathons, but they'll literally run for two, five, ten hours and do these courses overnight. You know, you talked about Tour de France, which is another incredible endurance sport. I want to talk about. You know, we talked about the benefits of obviously. Uh, at altitude of being able to, th the benefits of taking ketones at altitude and, and raising your blood oxygen level. We talked about the benefits of doing very strenuous physical tasks that would typically give you mental degradation. And, and yet ketones don't degrade uh, or, or at least are able to boost both your physical and, and your mental performance. What are you seeing? It, it, does the same thing show up in endurance sports? And do you find commonalities across running and biking? And, and if not, what are you seeing there? And what do you think the, that ketones are really delivering for endurance athletes? It's interesting for endurance because you're basically inducing 
hypoxia, where when you're running really hard or biking really hard, you're, you're getting out of breath. Like you're, you're reducing over time. You're not at full oxygenation level. Your body's getting, getting tired. You're not getting enough oxygen to everything. So you're basically inducing hypoxia, which is the exact same thing that is happening when you're at altitude. Altitude is just like an outside factor that directly reduces the amount of oxygen you have available. But yeah, like you, if you're panting, if you're out of breath, like you are getting, you're getting less oxygen than your body wishes that it had. We're also seeing some other interesting effects with cyclists and, and runners. I mean, I, I don't think there's a meaningful difference to like parse between cycling versus running versus it. It's all like endurance. Sure. Uh, we're seeing something really interesting with not just in the performance context, but also in the recovery context where there's such a thing as overtraining where if anyone's ever gotten to like a certain level of of sports where you're you're training for an Ironman or maybe you're a serious college athlete or you're just really into CrossFit or whatever and you're doing it all the time every day. There's such a thing as overtraining where it it backfires, where you basically like train so hard that your body like flips on this like stress mode where you actually get reduced appetite and it's counterproductive because you're training so hard that your body's not getting enough time to recover. So you're not able to go and do it again the next day. That becomes a really important factor when you look at something like the Tour de France or military missions where it's not just that you're running a marathon, it's that you're running a marathon like everyone day, every day for 21 days. In the Tour de France, you're biking, it's, a, it's three weeks long, it's actually coming up in a, in a month here. In July, we're doing a ton of work with our, with our teams, we're doing partnerships uh, with great cyclists and, and doing some interesting stuff. I'm actually flying out to Colorado in a month and linking up with Lance and some of the former USPS, U- United States Parcel Service, like the, the GOAT like, team from, uh, from back in the day. Um, there's this really interesting study done around cycling. This is why this is part of why cyclists are so particularly interested in this. Is that there was a study done a few years ago by this Belgian researcher where they showed that okay, we know that when you overtrain, it is counterproductive. They had two groups of participants. One had ketones, the other did not. They were they had the participants biking twice a day for three weeks, so it was meant to simulate Tour de France conditions and one of the groups had ketones, the other did not. Aside from that, they were able to eat ad libitum. So as much as they wanted of of anything else. And what they saw over that course of three weeks is that by week three, the ketone group had a 15% higher training load, and also had a 5% increase in final time trial performance. So and then when they when they looked further into it, they were saying that the ketone group was having less symptoms of that overreaching, overtraining, that basically ketones were helping people to recover faster. So not just like drinking it and acutely, immediately helping performance, but when when they were having it three times a day, mixed around with their training, and then training every single day, they had less of, there's, there's a few hormones that are indicative of overtraining that you can you can measure, GPT-15, and it shows that you're overtraining. In the ketone group, they had less of that. And then on the actual performance, they the the cyclists that were having the ketones were were per, just performing better. So it's really interesting. This is where it starts having some interesting dimensions to it. Where it's okay, it's not just ketones as a source of energy; it's also ketones as a as signaling. It's basically signaling to your body to activate a parasympathetic rest and recovery mode, and it's helping people to recover better. There's a few other interesting studies that have been done around this where ketones if you have ketones with your post-workout protein that you increase muscle protein resynthesis so if you work out really hard you get a lot of micro tears in your muscles you go and drink protein the idea is like rebuild the muscle bigger and stronger if you have ketones with that protein you accelerate the rate of muscle protein resynthesis so basically you know today's recovery is tomorrow's performance that like you're able to do better today, you're able to recover better today, and then go out and do it again tomorrow. So that that is a angle to ketones that people are getting really interested in even more so than just the acute performance, but the more like chronic, hey, if I'm spending more time with elevated ketone levels, 
it seems like my body is like recovering, bouncing back faster. So a lot of interesting stuff there, a lot of interesting stuff with, with cycling in particular. And I think cycling is just, it happens to be the tip of the spear because I think cyclists are kind of nuts. So like we, like I'm, I say this as a cyclist, like, uh, they're very dialed in on their nutrition and their wattage and their wattage per kilogram. And, mm-hmm. and, and so they, st- they tend to be much more dialed in on like performance specifically than, you know, a basketball player cares about this, but like they also care about 16 other things court IQ, ball handling, teamwork. Like they care about a lot of other things. Cyclists tend to be really, really dialed in on per, like just abject performance. And so it's been an interesting test group for us. Yeah. I mean, even the, the results that you shared, they're like a 15% higher workload, uh, you know, or capacity is staggering. That's not small at all. That's a very sizable difference, not to mention, you know, the kind of 5% and then the, the improvement in, in recovery. So none of that is small. It seems very significant in terms of the difference. Yeah, those are real numbers. People are familiar with that level of performance. It's a, it's gains of that magnitude are hard to come by when you're, when you're at performing that level. It's, it's very tight margins at that level. I feel like most people are chasing single digit percentage gains. So you can get double yeah. digit in that or, you know, it's, it's much, much larger. I'd love to know, you know, talk about the development of um, the kind of V1 of the ketone, dr- the drinkable ketone product you had, and then the latest version of Ketone IQ. And where I wanted to start with this first version, um, and I'll try to find a, you know, for anyone that wasn't familiar with HVMN when you guys produced that, it was a super cute, tiny little bottle and had a nice little form factor to it. So try to find a photo and include that in the show notes just for fun. Um, but you know what, where I wanted to start off is it sounds like the origin story in part is finding this DARPA research, um, that basically did quite a bit of foundational research around, yes, it can go through the GI track. It's relatively safe. You can produce it on its own. So it sounds like, or maybe I'm guessing you take this and then you decide, okay, now we're going to go and try to figure out how to manufacture this. How much work did you have to do to figure out manufacturing and get that off the ground and then just talk about what it was like to work on this version one of the product and when you thought you had something that you were ready to release to some you know to some subset of customers it reminds me of when you read the early steve jobs steve wozniak like soldering computer parts together in their garage (laughs) like steve jobs is like running around like they sold their first 200 computers and then had to run back to the garage and solder some circuit boards together it was it was that kind of mode where it was at scale so it was not just being done like by a chemist at a lab bench it was like more professional than that it was being done at some level of scale but there's there's scale and then there's scale right there's there's the ability to make ten thousand units is very different from the ability to make a million units and in the abstract when we think about systems design i'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the principle that Every time you 10x a system, you rebuild it from scratch. And that's true in computing. That's true in production. That's true in a lot of areas. Like Moore's law doesn't just like happen incidentally. Like the way that the way that computers are getting quicker is like the approach is radically changing. It looks like this nice, smooth curve, but behind the scenes, there's, there's some really paradigm shifting step functions that are happening. Uh, so it was it was that for us where we figured out a way to to get it out at the kind of order of ten thousand to a hundred thousand bottle, but it was very hard and expensive, and but like what's there to say? It's like there's there's no regrets on it. It's like in hindsight, everything's twenty twenty. Yeah, it's like in hindsight, oh yeah, like Apple should have launched the iPhone in nineteen ninety two. It's like well, <laughs> you kind of had to do yeah what you had to do you in the to order climb that the you curve. did it totally. Yep. Yeah. So there's there's no regrets on it. We we just had a expensive process even just the core blueprint of what we were building was overly complicated so it was a little bit of addition by subtraction right like shaving off parts of it to make it make it simpler and more direct to what we were trying to do working with it, it bringing in capital partners right so andreessen backed us in our in our seed round and we've gotten some amazing investors that have joined the the ride so, but like being able to get great investors, like it helps to be able to show, hey, we have this imperfect product, not quite ready for the mainstream, but good enough for the good enough to secure a seven figure government contract, good enough to unlock the like core elite 
operators and athletes. And then we have this vision that we can bring it down and make it, you know, everyday collagen level. But it, it's all connected. So it's like, okay, you get your version one, it's the best thing in the world until you have your version two out there. And I, you know, we're working hard on what version three looks like. So there's always a, there's always a evolution to it. And, you know, you got, you got to go to, you cannot let perfect get in the way of good enough. You got to get something out there as a proof of concept and then roll into the next thing and the next thing. Yeah. Well, especially with what your guys are doing, where you're literally pioneering something that's brand new that doesn't exist in any other, at least not that I'm aware of, in any other form factor that's similar to what you guys have done that's meant for the purposes that you guys have built this for. Um, so, you know, I'd be curious to talk a little bit about, um, I'm guessing this move to Ketone IQ was maybe that 10x order of magnitude redesign or rethink. Am I getting that right? And yes. can you talk a little bit about what you innovated on and changed as you move from this V1 to V2? Because I know part of it was taste. I'm sure there's other things. Yeah, there's a lot of innovation going on in, in biosynthesis where the cutting edge of making any molecule, pharmaceuticals, flavors, any kind of targeted molecule is, the old way of doing it is petrochemical where Petroleum products are very dynamic because you have these long carbon chains. You can make into anything. You can make into all sorts of plastics, pharmaceuticals. Like, like there's a reason that we use fossil fuels. Like they're very flexible and robust, but they're also fossil fuels. There's, they're limited. The production on it can be dirty, and they're they're it's clearly not like the way that things will be made in 100 years from now or 200 years from now. What we're seeing and what I mean, what what we are doing and, and one of the big innovations that we had was switching our supply chain to a more biosynthetic way where state of the art of making target molecules instead of using petroleum basis is you you do you you make genetically modified yeast. So you like specifically change the genetics of that of that bacteria. It can be yeast, it can be E. coli, it can be a specific types of bacteria, you genetically modify it such that when you feed it something normal, like a feedstock, like you feed it sugar, that because of how it has been modified, it produces as a byproduct, the target molecule. So this, this has its own cost curve to it, where like, you know, when first doing this, it's super expensive, like, you know, first time people mapped out the human genome, it was extremely expensive. And now you have 23andMe, like, first, the first instances of doing of doing bacteria generated pharmaceuticals and other molecules, super expensive, but it's coming down to a spot where it is on par or even lower than the petrochemical way of doing it. So that's been a big innovation that we've made. We've also made innovations on the ketone itself, where I'm trying to think the best analogy here, but in a way, our first version was really complicated where we were where we had a couple of different similar ketones that were esterified together it was very complicated but it was very it was very um i think i think people familiar with product design or engineering in general have this sense of like sometimes your first your first concept is like too complicated and then you like shave it off it's like like tinder was like simpler than match.com uber simpler than calling a taxi cab. We had that same dynamic where our first version was this like really complicated thing. We almost did it because we could. It was really like scientifically crazy and interesting. And then the insight was like, hey, this can be much simpler and work as good or better and be dramatically cheaper. It sounds so obvious when I say it. That's why I'm I'm kind of thinking hard about it. It's like, so, yeah, so it's, it seems so obvious. Yeah, do the simpler thing. But I, I was just say like for our version one, we had something that was more complicated that felt correct at the time. Yeah. But then yeah. as it was on market, and as we learn more and just wisened up, sometimes like the smarter thing is to go in a simpler direction. And, and that's what that's a big part of what led to V2. So yeah, it, updates in manufacturing technology, shifting away from petrochemical towards biosynthesis and then simplifying on the formula itself and then just like yeah good old-fashioned product development work formulation work figuring out how to how to make it taste well we did uh, one of the subtasks of our work with the dod is around 
organoleptics, which is fancy word for saying how your body senses things that you're eating. So how how does like like at the molecular level, not just like sipping it and swirling around in your mouth, but at the molecular level, what is happening? Like what is making this taste the way that it tastes? And then what can we do to address that? What can we do on the formulation to make it taste more palatable? So a lot of a lot of deep science around how to make it taste better. The you know very early versions of ketones were crazy tasting. What what can we do to make it taste uh, taste better? So a lot of uh, blocking and tackling, a lot of you know biochemistry, a lot of formulation development that has has yielded, I think, really good results. I mean, it, listening to you describe that process in V1 being hyper complicated, but you're not thinking it was hyper complicated at the time, and then we're finding it over time. Anyone listening that's been a designer or an engineer completely understands that use case because, you know, with the background in design, I know that experience myself of, you know, you don't know how to design it any simpler until you know how to design it any simpler. So you have to go through that that progression um, to be able to get there. So no, it, it makes it makes total sense. I'd love to now, you know, change with just a few kind of simple closing questions. And one of the ones I wanted to start with was, you know, clearly what we've talked about a couple of times is, and this is why I find what you're building and working on so fascinating is one, the the implications of this, like to, to you know, uh, to make a, maybe a weird analogy. I'm a big fan of adaptogens. You know, I think if, if you can have what, well, I'll just talk about myself, maybe I'll, rather than, you know, proselytize. I, I, I've tried to make the intentional switch. It is about, you know, 18 months ago of cutting out coffee during the middle of the day and drinking adapt, adaptogens. And, and the brand that I drink is Rasa, um, just because they have really high quality uh, adaptogens and herbalists on staff. Um, and that's another example of, I just feel like it's been a massive quality of life improvement just by changing one simple thing I'm doing during the day. And so when I think about what, what you're building with ketones and bringing the affordability down and more people being powered by ketones as opposed to by glucose, it, I mean, massive, massive implications. Applications. And, you know, you're doing that and bringing the cost down in order of magnitude, and you're trying to get it to 40 cents, you know, as a long term goal is fascinating. So what I want to talk about for a second is when you think five years out, what, you know, and, and feel free to share or not share as openly as you might want to, what, you know, how, what, why, what might we all see from HVMN in terms of products, you have a drinkable ketone now, what does this future roadmap look like? And or what state of the world do you hope to have in five years? Yeah, that's a that's a great question where right now what we've created is the primitive, we always considered a nutritional primitive and meaning that in the kind of computer science or mathematical sense where it's a fundamental building block. And what, we've, what we're doing right now is we're selling just the primitive and we're, we've been iterating on the primitive of what is the best ketone delivery mechanism. And so right now, ketone IQ is the best as we continue to innovate on that, that's the more like short to medium term, the more medium to long term as you're asking is, and I think you touched on this with where we see collagen today, where it's, it's in bars, it's everywhere, it's in different drinks, it's <laughs> uh, ingredient, uh, you can get collagen in your coffee, you can get it, it's in all sorts of different formats. That's without giving too much away that that's how we're thinking about it, where, hey, ketones are it's interesting, primitive. How does that start looking if we build on top of ketones as a platform. So ketone IQ is primitive. Okay, well, what if we use ketone IQ specifically for an endurance product, like a, a goo shot that you can take on your bike? It should have things besides ketones in it that complement that use case where it's powered by ketone IQ, but it also has a, an array of different carbohydrates in, in it because yep. if you're biking, you want all the substrates that you can possibly have you might even want BCAAs because it's a it's technically a, a protein, but it, it, your body can turn it into energy really quickly. You want as many different types of, of energy as possible. That's just for the, the endurance sports use case. We also have a lot of people that are using ketone IQ as a alcohol replacement. Like So totally different use case, but it's because you feel a little bit of a lift from drinking ketones. A lot of people know alcohol is not great for you. So it's cool that you know, there's other non-alcoholic options out there, but a lot of times those are just flavored water. And okay, I can make a nice little cocktail out of ketone IQ and it's it's not alcohol, so I'm not getting ethanol and acetaldehyde buildup. Like, and it's but it's also not this like inert flavored water. It it like does this thing, it's healthy for me and it like it makes me feel pleasant. So what 
about if we make a alcohol replacement that is more like decidedly alcohol where you think about, you know, like a nice glass bottle and partnering with a premier chef or sommelier, like you, you really build into that use case. So you take this primitive of ketone IQ and you draw out the line to, okay, the endurance sport sub brand or sister brand looks like this, the alcohol replacement sub brand or sister brand looks like this. So that's an area where we almost have, I'm chomping at the bit, like we have too much creativity on it. And there's so many ideas to do there. And one of the challenges as an entrepreneur is to really focus where, okay, like as exciting as all those things are, I want to be a little bit patient and continue to push on the primitive. Right now, it's allowing people to go and make what they want. So if someone wants to go on a bike ride, you got to mix ketone IQ with the rest of your stack, make your make your witches brew, make your water <laughs> bottle of your special concoction that works for you. If you want it as an alcohol replacement, cool, we're providing you with the primitive, you can go and mix it with soda water and lime, you can do that. And pushing and just keeping really focused and getting the primitive out there and holding back just a tick before launching all of the secondary tertiary extensions off of it. This is going into business mode. This is no like, not like a biochemistry answer. It's just from a business perspective, need to focus. Like a lot of people need to just know what collagen, basic nutritional collagen is. You got to hit you got to just repeat it until your your voice is hoarse of just basic nutritional collagen until the level of awareness around it is at a point where you go and launch all the other fun derivatives off of it. So it's taking a lot of patience and discipline and, you know, co-founder executive team conversations around when is that right moment? Like, when do you fractal it out? And I think, I, who knows? I think, I think we're right. We'll see how it pans out. But I think that there is something to be said for, you know, you just, you got to get your MacBook sales up to a certain point before you yes. release the iPhone, right? You got to get, yes. you got to focus. And I think that can be one of the most painful things as an entrepreneur where we're really like creative. We have all this spark. We see all this opportunity, all these use cases. But the right answer is, I think, is to focus on the primitive and bide our time. I think you're totally right. And then, <laughs> We'll have the opportunities to, ex ex you can always extend it later on. Yes. I think Ketone IQ is a massive step function improvement over the previous version of the product. And so, you know, one, kudos to you for persisting in, in your team over, over the years it's taken to kind of iterate on that. And I think from here, my guess is in five years, we'll probably see many different form factors. And I love the way yes. you describe it as fractaling out. Uh, it's a, you know, kind of amazing visual um, to, to think about what that is. You know, one of the use cases you shared earlier that I would be really excited to see is a post-workout protein shake that takes, uh, you know, Ketone IQ right. uh, uh, along with it. For now, especially after hearing you say that, I'm going to start taking ketone IQ <laughs> after workouts because it seems uh, it seems incredibly helpful. I want to ask just a couple of quick closing questions. One of the, I guess, one of the questions I wanted to ask, and this may be hard to put an answer on. When I when I talk with founders and I think about um, you know what you've done, what you and your team have done over the last few years to push forward ketone IQ, it's very difficult. You're working in a space without a ton of competition. You're pioneering on something that uh, my guess would be there's not that many other. You can't really triangulate. There's not that many other people that are pioneering on on, on ketones. What do you credit with your success in building HVMN so far? And and what do you what do you think you've gotten right to get to this point in time? Because clearly, I would think you've gotten a lot right. <laughs> Well, thanks. There's always different ways to see it. It's always like, hey, we are at the top of the mountain. We've like we finished the hero's journey of everything that's brought us here today, but we're also at the very first steps of the next cycle sure. of the hero's journey. Like we're we're at the the top of the next inning. So there's I appreciate the the compliments on getting to where we are today. It's still, you know, Jeff Bezos likes to say it's every day is day one. I don't know if he still says that now he's retired. Maybe it's, maybe he's done with it. No, day. no, it's, he's, he's got no more days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like day one until, until you're a bajillionaire. And then, okay, I guess, I guess now we're done. But, but that, yeah, it's, it's always day one. There's always the whole mountain out in front of us. What do I credit it to? Yeah, there's, there's no one else doing what we are doing. As an entrepreneur, it's up to you to find the things that rhyme with what you're doing, though. Hmm. Like there's, in any case, in any entrepreneur, entrepreneur's journey, like no one was doing exactly what Stripe was doing. But you have to be creative about it. So it's so 
I think what we're doing rhymes with what a lot of functional mushroom companies have done. It rhymes with what happened with collagen. It rhymes with what happened with CBD. A lot of those examples that I've mentioned, it rhymes with what Gatorade did in the 1970s when they worked with the Florida Gators and they said, hey, water is great, but it but you're actually sweating a lot and you need electrolytes. Let's make Gatorade that has electrolytes in it. And electrolytes at the time were, it was this, how many syllable, four syllable word that, or three syllable word, it's this, it's an SAT word. Not everyone knew what an <laughs> electrolyte was. And they had to beat people over the head with, with the education around that for decades. And so, so we're doing with ketones what Gatorade did with electrolytes. So yeah, it's, it's a matter of being creative on where you are drawing inspiration from like in your space and nutrition space, as well as more broadly in technology in general, and try to pattern match where you can. Like, I, I think it's, I think it can be dangerous to say, oh, what we're doing is totally unique, totally unprecedented. Like, yeah, it should be like, they're, like, if you're doing, if you're entrepreneuring on something interesting, it should be different from what anyone else is doing. But you do yourself a disservice if you if you think that what you're doing is too special and unique. Like it's because you can just you can steal like an artist. Like if you find the other patterns to match to, the other comparables, you can see what worked for them and what didn't and learn from their lessons. So you have to occupy both states. What we're doing is completely unique and special and it's a holy grail. No one's ever done this. And at the same time, hey, this rhymes a lot with these other innovations that we've seen. What did they do that worked for them? Let's, let's copy that playbook. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said. Well, I, you know, I have many more questions at some point. I would love to have you on for a round two, maybe when you start getting into that fractaling out uh, mode, this has been a fascinating conversation. And my hope is that one people listening have a much better understanding of ketones, why, well, one, how powerful they are as an energy source, how much better they are than glucose and how people can be incorporating them into their daily life or the sports that they do or the physical activities they do just to reach peak performance, uh, peak performance. So thank you so much for coming on, Michael. Um, I really, really appreciate it. It's been so much fun. Daniel, this was a lot of fun and really appreciate the the background research you did and coming with informed questions. I feel like we covered a ton of ground today. It's a lot of fun. I, I hope so. I feel like we did. I feel like we did. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Michael.